This is a success story of one small community, but it could be anywhere. It could be your town. Nestled at the entrance of the Birds of Prey National Preservation Area on the edge of the southwest Idaho desert is the small farming community of Cuna, Idaho. It's a good deal like many other small towns in America. There are five schools, seven churches, a park in the center of town, and a main street about five blocks long. Let us take you back just two years in the city of Cuna. Like many other rural communities in America, Cuna was sharing a common problem. The farms were disappearing. They were being replaced by rural subdivisions. The agricultural base of the community was changing. Some of the stores that once had supplied the farmers' needs had to close their doors. Many of the businesses in town had stood empty for a long time. People of the community were concerned and went looking for ways to solve their problems. One solution was found in a local resource, Dorothy Whitmire, a part-time planner for the city. Dorothy, how did you hear about this program on trees? Well, the mayor sent me to a meeting. It was sponsored by the 1990 Farm Bill and the SBA, and that's the Small Business Administration. And at this meeting, they gave us a lot of facts on, on trees. One of those facts that they brought out was that one million trees would do away with or sequester about 18 million tons of carbon. And I was very, very impressed with that fact. And I thought, gee, if, if one million trees can do that, I know CUNA can't plant that many, but we could sure you know, plant a few anyway to help this situation. But really, as the program went on at this meeting, they told us some things that I hadn't heard before. I didn't realize that if you plant trees, it's going to stimulate the economy. That it, where you plant trees, people go. People go and shop where there are trees. And that this would help our town that it could lower light bills and heating bills costs, that it would stimulate growth. These were important facts to my town. And so I wanted to get with this program and take it back to CUNA because I knew we wouldn't only be helping the world, but we would be helping my town. We'd be helping CUNA. How did you get the program started? Well, I know that anytime you go anywhere and you want to get something done, you go to the shakers and doers, as I call them. Ask the busiest people in town. You know, they're the people that are going to do this. And so what I did is I went to the people that I knew, the people that I knew were really busy and, and doing everything in town. You know, they were the ones who, who would do the work. I knew it. So I got on the phone, and I called about five or six of those. And I got them together, and I said, hey, what if? What if we could plant trees here in Cuna? What would it do for us? And I told them the things I'd learned at this meeting. And I said, if we can do this, would you help me do it? And they said, well, sure, I'd help you. So we formed a tree committee. From that tree committee, we knew it'd be an uphill battle to get things through the city council and, and places like that, because that's hard to do. Anywhere you go, I don't care what you do, it's hard to get things through a city council. So we got a plan. We made a tree plan. And we devised a plan where we would plant 500 trees over the next five years in the city of Cuna. And then, because we knew five people don't make much of an impression when you go to a city council meeting or any place before the public, you want a lot of people. We took this then and we went to the Chamber of Commerce. And with the Chamber of Commerce behind us, and they were all behind us, they just, the businessmen of that town said, hey, this is great, we need to increase our business. Sure, we'll help you. So we got the Chamber behind us and with our plan in hand, we went to the city council then, and we said, would you help us if we could get a grant, a small amount of money to put trees in CUNA? Could you help us? Would you put in an ordinance and, and help us do these things? They said, sure, we'd be glad to. So we had already accomplished the hardest part of doing this. But this was such a big project, Dorothy. How did you get so many people involved? Well. People care. People come out of the woodwork to plant trees. You can't imagine. All you have to say is trees and people are there. People care about their environment. They care about their quality of life. They want to improve it. Even if it's good, and CUNA was good before the trees, but it's better now. It just is something that people are willing to do. And so we went out and we tried to get volunteers because part of this SBA program, you have to get matching funds. And that means that you have to get things from people because cities don't have money to put out for these kinds of things. You need to go out and find other ways that you can do this. So we got volunteers. 
we got people to come in that would do things like dig water lines. They'd install pipes. Uh, we went, to, we needed tree boxes planted. So we wanted to plant one tree in one box in 10 different boxes up the street. Well, I knew that a lumber company couldn't afford to give us 10 redwood boxes to plant trees in. So we went to 10 lumber companies and we asked each one to donate one box, and they did. We had no problems with that. We contacted our local cable company, and the cable company offered to come out and do the trenching to put our water lines in. We had people from all over the town, scouts and churches, all kinds of organizations there willing to help. What results have you observed from this project, Dorothy? Well, I think the biggest change I have seen in CUNA is the downtown core area from this, the real true results. When we started this project, there was five empty buildings on Main Street. It looked like the town was abandoned. Within probably three months time from the time that we planted those trees, you could see the business owners, they were painting the fronts of their stores, they were putting up flower boxes, all five empty buildings were filled. The town now doesn't have, well it has one empty building left, but all the rest are filled and they're thriving and what's more, a new business was established because of this. A nursery came to town and now a quarter block of our city has beautiful landscaping all over it because a nurseryman came in and he has his wares there. So we've not only improved the economy of the people who were there, but also brought a new business into town because of this. Greg Nelson has been the mayor of CUNA for nine years. All of the urban forestry improvements have happened during his administration. We ask him to tell us how this has helped his town. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, CUNA is a small town and uh, certainly rural development and uh, retaining business and attracting business is extremely important to us. So we adopted their urban forestry development to improve the city, to improve it the way it looked, to uh, improve commerce in it, and it's worked like a charm. Our businessmen are happy, we're doing more business, more commerce. Our city is happy, it's uh, very pleased. As a matter of fact, the growth rate in CUNA has, uh, is astounding. We've had to put a moratorium on growth because of all the people that want to move into town. We're a good looking city, that's what we uh, our intention was in developing this, and it's uh, worked very well, not only for commerce, but for just uh, city pride and improvement. But hasn't this tree program cost taxpayers a lot of money? It hasn't cost our taxpayers that much. Uh, we're, we're a small town. We've not raised any taxes for nine years, or the whole period of time that I've been the mayor. And the, uh, what we've done is had a lot, uh, we had a small grant from the uh, Department of Lands, Urban Forestry for buying the trees. We turned out the, the entire community to plant, to uh, take care of our trees. We involved our youth in projects and we brought on a very large project for a very minimal amount of dollars. The city passed a tree ordinance. Can you explain why? Well, after we've got this much investment, into uh, our trees, and it is a sizable investment. Each of those trees uh, is at least $200, and some up to, uh, if you took the total amount that's uh, invested in them with time and, and love, uh, could be considerably more than that. And so we pass this to protect our trees and to protect the investment, and the, uh, this only makes good business for, uh, if we're gonna put this kind of, of money and effort into a project, we want that for future generations. So we have a tree ordinance, yes, and it protects our investment, and our people are insistent that we do have it. Let's take a look at what a town with a population of 1,955 people can do. The local newspaper helped to support the project. To protect the volunteers, permission was given to block the main street. Volunteers came in all shapes and sizes to do many jobs.
Nurserymen did the actual planting of the trees. There was plenty of finish work for everyone to do. The first trees were planted in November. Volunteers tied big red ribbons with their names on them to the trees. The ribbons were left up to decorate the town for Christmas. Over 100 high school seniors gave up the first day of spring vacation to help prepare the green belt for planting. I think I gotta give you some more dirt down there. <laughs> Hi, Mom, we're number one. <laughs> Local merchants prepared food for the volunteers. I think they will appreciate what we've done. Totally. City crews dug the tree planting holes and installed water lines. Once again, trees were planted by the nursery and more volunteers came to do the finish work. Arbor Day is an annual celebration now in CUNA. A training session is held in the morning to teach how to care for the trees. In the afternoon, many people take part in the celebration. The mayor gives a proclamation. Youth groups participate. Okay, we have the Heartwood. The Heartwood. <laughs> and the Root. And the Xylem. And the Cambium. And the Phloem. And the Bark. Louder. Thank you, everyone in our tree. <laughs> the CUNA Chamber of Commerce gives out spring beautification awards to homeowners with the most improved landscape. CUNA has agreed to spend a minimum of $2 for each person toward tree projects each year. For these efforts, CUNA has received the Tree City USA Award. A sign painted on a building wall on Main Street by a volunteer gives the overall picture of CUNA's spirit and accomplishments. It lists all of the volunteer groups that helped on the leaves around the large tree and the businesses that donated across the bottom of the sign. And of course, they plant a tree on Arbor Day. <laughs> Dorothy now works for the Idaho Department of Lands as a volunteer services coordinator. She says give her a call and she'll help you get your program started. The mayfly hatch that we're seeing on Silver Creek now, characteristic of midsummer, is the famous trico hatch. It is an extremely small black and white mayfly, size 20 to 22. It, it comes off in unreal numbers, sometimes clouds where it limits visibility. Um, a fish will come up and slurp and sometimes take a dozen at a time. And you just hope that one of your tiny flies on 7X tippet is, is in that group of flies that it takes. 
there are three or four dominant aquatic plants that, that grow in the creek. They, they offer habitat for the aquatic insects, uh, and of course the fishery itself, as, as they, they force the stream into narrow, deep channels sometimes, and the, and the fish can get down in there and, and feel secure. Uh, along with that, the aquatic plants are so important to this habitat that uh, some of the information we've gathered on the entomology of the stream has determined that no other, no other stream in the world has been recorded to contain aquatic insects in the number Silver Creek does. Unique as Silver Creek was, buying it for $500,000 was a big step for the Nature Conservancy, but fly fishermen were worried about losing the stream back in 1975. These fly fishermen who used this preserve, or not preserve, but the property then, uh, were up in arms and concerned that uh, developers were going to purchase it. Uh, what we did was we came in and we gauged the amount of public interest in the project and decided that uh, we would take it on and just raise the funds. A fish and game department study was in the process of being completed at that time. It verified the, the questions of many, many fishermen over the years that Silver Creek's fishery was in a state of decline. And in fact, when the study was completed in 1977, I believe, it, it verified that fact that, that the fishery was at an all-time low. The growth rates, uh, the general condition of the fish had deteriorated drastically since 1950, um, probably due to two things, stream condition, sedimentation, spawning, gravel being lost, that sort of thing, plus the fact that hatchery fish were being introduced in here in order to keep, maintain a fishery under all this public pressure. So the, the natural wild fishery that's in there does not have the opportunity to spawn and reproduce. Um, that's a long process of uh, removing sediment because Silver Creek is a spring creek. It, it moves at that velocity you see now constantly. It doesn't flush itself. It takes years and years and years for sediments to move downstream. Our theory was we needed to move upstream and work on the cause. We did not feel comfortable in simply managing two and a half miles of Silver Creek while some 30 miles of upstream tributary were dictating the future of this stream. So we, we implemented a rather aggressive upstream program whereby we purchased another 800 acre ranch the end result of that purchase has been uh, we removed about 300 head of cattle from the river. Uh, we moved the farming back uh, perhaps 100 yards away from the river on the average. And we've changed, uh, we've retired some fields. We've, we've uh, taken some of it and put it into alfalfa instead of uh, consistent barley. And so that was, that was an 800-acre step that brought us several more miles of tributary to Silver Creek. Management by easements and buying land made a better mousetrap, and people beat the proverbial path. I started up here in 1979 for the Conservancy, and the estimates...